All right. Always happy to have on Andy Patton from Locked On Zags podcast and the Locked On College Basketball podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Andy Patton CBB. Andy, how's it going? And I'm sure like it's it. The week is finally here. I'm starting to get juice for this matchup, St. Mary's and Gonzaga on Saturday. Yeah, I feel like uh, St. Mary's fans are going to be a little bit more excited about this matchup than Gonzaga fans right now. We're kind of coming off of a. Uh a week that didn't go the way that we hoped it would in, in terms of a 2-0 and week, you know, still beat San Francisco at home, still beat Pacific on the road, but not particularly inspiring performances from the team. So I think, especially when you look at the way St. Mary's has been playing lately, it's definitely a, a little bit more anxious energy uh, in Spokane than it has been in the past, but certainly always, uh, always excited for this game to be coming up. Yeah, and and you mentioned mentioned it like Gonzaga's had some slow starts over the last few weeks. Slow start against Santa Clara, slow start against Pepperdine, against Pacific, against USF. And but but in each of those cases, they've had much better second halves. They've been able to make those adjustments, and especially against both Pacific and Pepperdine, and also USF. We saw like Graham Ek just absolutely went off in those in those games in the second half. Just kind of talk about like what you're seeing from this squad because they are starting off slow, but they are figuring it out later in the game. Yeah, it's interesting. This has kind of been a trend for Gonzaga for a long time. Like I remember this a lot a decade or so ago when I was a student, they had a lot of slow starts and they figured it out in the second half. I think part of that is is Mark Few making halftime adjustments. Uh, and I think another part of it is just that Gonzaga is kind of going to go in with their game plan. Teams are having to game plan against them. That has always been the case in the WCC. St. Mary's is one of the few teams that, you know, you kind of have to have a, a more distinct plan against. So historically, Gonzaga goes in and does what they want to do, and the other team is doing something different to try to stop them. Pacific ran a zone, which they don't normally do. And we saw other teams trying different strategies against them. And, and you know, are they going to double gram? Are they going to not double gram? And, and, you know, every team kind of does it a little differently. So I think Gonzaga has to be kind of reactive to whatever the opposing team decides to do. And sometimes it it takes them a little longer. And I think with this particular iteration of the Zags, because they don't have a lot of familiarity playing with each other, they're a really new group, only three returners from, from last year, and they're kind of all playing different roles than they did last year. So I think it's just taken them a little longer to make those in-game adjustments. We are seeing them happen. And, and you mentioned Graham, I think he has 37 points in the last two second halves of basketball games. He's been an absolute beast uh, when he gets into the second half. Would love to see that start a little early Earlier for him, obviously that would uh, be something that would help Gonzaga fans, you know, breathe a little better during the games. But uh, certainly, seeing what he's able to do in the second half of games has been a huge boost, and, and is the reason that the Zags came out of last week on skates. And I mean, one of the other things that seems, at least, like you look at the stat sheet, and it actually has been a little bit of a concern, has actually been the rebounding against mm -hmm. some of the tougher rebounding teams. USF came in out rebounding Gonzaga. Santa Clara did the same thing against the better squads, some of the better squads in the WCC. It's, how much of a concern is the rebounding been over the maybe the, la the last couple of weeks, at least against these opponents that are in the, in the conversation of actually being at the top of the league? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't have expected that to be an issue. And, and in fact, when I, I spoke with Coach Chris Gerlison, the San Francisco head coach, uh, the day before the game, and he talked specifically about – rebounding. He said, you know, Gonzaga's plus 10 on the boards, like this is a big area for us. And, you know, for them, they had they have a seven footer who comes off the bench and you think he played a minute in that game, if not less, like he played the last 30 seconds of the first half. Uh, Mobo didn't have a particularly great game and yet they still managed to out rebound Gonzaga and, and Santa Clara, same thing. Now, Santa Clara is one of the tallest teams in the country per average height. So I'm not as surprised for them, but for Gonzaga, they, they recently made a, a starting lineup change and added Ben Gregg over Dusty Stromer. They're starting three big men who are 6'9 and taller, and yet they're struggling to get boards. I think uh, a phys a physicality thing in some ways. Uh, guys are getting pushed around a little bit, which is not something we're used to with these Gonzaga teams. Uh, certainly the guards are not particularly big, so occasionally we'll see the guards getting out-rebounded, which isn't as uh, surprising, but I think the rebounding is something that, you know, on a, on a list of concerns coming into this game against St. Mary's and certainly uh, next week uh, against Kentucky, like rebounding is a, is a huge one with uh, if Gonzaga can't, can't get offensive rebounds, if Gonzaga can't give St. Mary's second chance opportunities, like that's going to be a huge problem for them. So it's definitely something I'm hoping the the staff is looking, pouring over tape and figuring out what is going on here. Why are we getting out rebounded by teams that frankly, we should be able to out rebound and, and trying to address that issue. 
and and you mentioned one of the switches. Obviously, the recent switch has been Ben Gregg, and you and I talked a bit about it on last Thursday mm-hmm. uh, about just like his insertion into that lineup and what difference it's made. Because like he is the, that Energizer Bunny that this team ne- that they've needed, um, mm-hmm. and the fact that he's been in the starting lineup clearly has made a difference for them. Um, and and you and I have also talked about this that it has that three big lineup has actually worked a little Mm -hmm. bit more than I think we thought it would initially. Uh, But just kind of talk about like what, like overall, it really just feels like this team has started to at least maybe like find their roles a little bit more in the last few weeks. And part of that has been in line with Ben Gregg and inserting into the lineup. Yeah. I think, I think a big part of Ben's move into the starting lineup was the benefit that it gave for for Dusty Stromer and Dusty had a really bad game against Pacific, so we're coming, you know, we're talking about him coming off of a, a rough stretch, and and he's a freshman, and I think that we're going to see inconsistencies from him just like we've seen inconsistencies from Braden Huff. Well, he'll have one game, two games, three games in a row, and you're like, wow. He looks fantastic. And I'm getting mailbag questions of like, is he going to break Drew Timmy's scoring record? And then he goes three games in a row with six total points. And you're like, oh, no, he's a freshman still. And he's still trying to find it. And Dusty, you know, he's not being asked to do as much offensively. So for him, a good game might be six points, four boards, uh, two steals. And a bad game might be zero points, three boards. And you're like, well, it doesn't look that different, but it feels different. And you can tell on the floor. And I think for the Zags, having Dusty be in a role where he's not asked to do as much where he is coming off the bench, which was his expectation all along when they, you know, they steel ventures was added really early in the off season. So there was always the plan that dusty was going to come off the bench. I'm confident that that had been what was communicated to him until ventures tears his ACL and they have to switch that lineup. And so I think putting dusty in a role that he's perhaps more comfortable, there's less pressure on him seems to have really worked. Meanwhile, Ben, is a great floor spacer. He's more adept at playing on the perimeter offensively in ways that I think helps Gonzaga. Uh, he can also go down low and, and body people if he needs to. He's a really good rebounder defensively. He's not as good of a perimeter defender as Dusty, and that has hurt Gonzaga. But that's what that's what Anton Watson is so great about, is you can move him around and you can say, okay, whoever the other team's best player is, whether they're a two, a three, a four, or five, we're going to throw Anton on him. And, and you know, Watson guarded Mobo, and, and Mobo didn't do much in that game against San Francisco. And so I think being able to have Watson be that kind of jackknife defensively has allowed them to play Ben in this starting lineup and get more rebounds and have more energy and also have a more uh, prepared Dusty Stromer coming off the bench. So it's really been a win in a lot of ways, uh, even coming off of a poor performance from Dusty last week. Uh, I think it's it's really helped this team in a lot of ways. And. And going into this one, it really does feel like, I mean, you're going to need everybody to play well against St. Mary's to to be able to beat this team. And I think the same goes for the other side. St. Mary's is going to have to play incredibly well to win in the kennel because it's just such a difficult place to win no matter how good you are. Mm-hmm. And just thinking about like what like Anton Watson is going to bring in this one. He is, he is the guy who's been there the longest. He has seen a multiple iterations of this St. Mary's team. Uh, he It feels like he's going to have to be like the the one who gets them going early on like to set the tone to an extent because he is the guy who has seen this team so often he's mm-hmm. had the ups the downs with the squad against St. Mary's knows the team and again this is a team that on the St. Mary's side is the same team as a year ago you yeah. have some missing pieces but every he's seen them all already mm-hmm. Um, so as is Nolan Hickman, uh, mm-hmm. but like just kind of it feels like to me that this is a game where Anton Watson is going to have to set the tone early. Yeah, I think he's the biggest X factor for this game. I think Graham E.K. and Mitchell Saxon are going to is going to be a big battle down low, of course, but that may you know neutralize Graham in, in ways that a lot of other teams in the WCC are unable to do. Uh, but if Mitchell's guarding Graham, then that you know that may free up Watson a little bit. I'm guessing Jefferson will probably guard him. Uh, And and Anton, you know, we've seen in games where Graham has had good post players against him. Santa Clara has good posts. Anton Watson had 30 plus points. Uh, UCLA has good post players. Anton Watson had 35 points. Like, I think that that is a recipe that Gonzaga has used when teams have been able to slow Graham down, when Graham gets in foul trouble, whatever it may be. Anton is, and a lot of times it's kind of just Gonzaga's offense breaks down and they can't, you know, the outside shooting's not there, which I think that'll be a struggle against St. Mary's in their defense. If the outside shooting's not there and if Graham E.K. is not there, Anton Watson's their offense. He was their offense against Santa Clara, against UCLA. There's been other games where he's just kind of 
taken over and, and they just give him the ball and let him go to work. And I think that we might see a fair amount of that. And I'm not sure how effective it'll be against St. Mary's one-on-one ISO basketball doesn't always work, but I didn't think it'd be effective against UCLA and he missed one shot. So he, he's capable of doing it. He's seen this team a lot. I think if I had to say which one player who needs to step up and have a career or at least a, a really, really good type of game for Gonzaga to win this game. I, it's Anton Watson. And frankly, it's not close. Like uh, other players will need to play well. Like you said, everybody will need to play well for Gonzaga to win this one and uh, vice versa. But it, it's going to come down, I think, a lot to Anton Watson, just based on personnel, as well as his kind of experience and familiarity playing against this team. Now we talked about and kind of alluded to it. I was going to ask you what, what does Gonzaga have to do to win? And I and so maybe it's more along the lines of, can what sort of style is this game going to look like if Gonzaga is going to win this ball game? Because we know that both of these coaches are very capable of making you play to their pace. Mark mm-hmm. View is very good at put forcing you to play more up tempo. Randy Ben mm-hmm. is very good at making you slow down. Is Gonzaga, could Gonzaga potentially win a St. Mary's paced game, or is this? a scenario where they're going to have to force the tempo and play a little bit faster to to be able to pull it off. Gonzaga is in an interesting spot this year because they're not playing as much of a tempo game as they have in the past. They they don't have the personnel for it. Really, they don't have the depth for it, frankly. I mean, if Ryan Nembhard and Nolan Hickman are going to play every minute of every game, which is more or less what has happened, uh, getting into track meets is just not something that they're going to be uh, able to do. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen against St. Mary's. That's more of a concern of like, are they just going to get outran by Kentucky the week later? Uh, but for St. Mary's, I think this Gonzaga team may not try to to – super outrun them the way they have in the past. I do think they'll try to get out and transition at every opportunity that they can, but St. Mary's doesn't turn the ball over all that over all that often. And Gonzaga is not going to try to get in transition on made baskets. So I I think it won't be as much of a running game. And Gonzaga is also a better defensive team than they've been in a while. And, And that's not getting as much attention as I think it maybe could or should just because most of the attention on, is on the fact that they haven't played all that well. They've lost more games than usual. They're not in the top 25, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a good defensive team. And so I think we're going to see a game that isn't as high scoring as Gonzaga's used to against St. Mary's. And, and, and a lower scoring, lower pace game might honestly favor the Gales, but it might be a benefit to this iteration of Gonzaga, which is why I'm so fascinated by this game, because I do think that Gonzaga's half court defense has improved enough to to make life a little harder for St. Mary's and the and the flip side they're not going to be out and running and and I think the half court offense Gonzaga's half court offense is the key to this game because I think they'll play fine defensively but St. Mary's is going to be great defensively as they always are and how Gonzaga responds to that how they find ways to get points are they settling for threes because St. Mary's is going under on screens are they two of 20 like they were against Santa Clara if so there's no way they win but what else can they do is it just Watson going crazy uh is Graham able to get sacks and foul trouble like there's a lot of different things that could happen that could really help Gonzaga in this game but I think it's really going to boil down to to their half court offense because I don't think we're going to see that tempo push that we've seen from them in the past uh yeah I I'd agree and again you mentioned the defense uh held USF with only one field goal for a 12 minute stretch there in the second half of that mm-hmm. game like mm-hmm. so that's something you do have to keep them know like that's a very efficient USF team and they yeah. only had one field goal for the vast majority of the second half mm-hmm. um up in Spokane so looking at this I mean the Zags have now won five straight against St. Mary's in the kennel last loss was one of the Jock Landale teams back in 2018 so it has been a while since St. Mary's has actually been able to win up there who like what does it look like or who do you think is the one who goes off for St. Mary's if they are to pull off what I would still consider an upset in the mm-hmm. kennel. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, I think it starts with Aiden Mahaney. I think it has to start there. Uh, you know, Gonzaga's guards, I think Nolan Hickman will probably draw the assignment. Uh, he's typically been Gonzaga's guard who who defends the opposing team's best guard. Uh, and Ryan Nembhard will, will probably get Marcelonis in that matchup. And it'll be really interesting to see how that works. Uh, Mahaney killed Gonzaga last year just by getting the high pick and rolls, going to the basket, uh, challenging Gonzaga's lack of rim protection. And that's still kind of an issue for the Zags. They're a better defensive team this year than they were last year in a lot of ways. And and part of that is, you know, Drew Timmy wasn't a particularly good defensive player. Julian Strother wasn't a particularly good defensive player. And and the players they've added in are, are better. But Graham E.K. is not like a huge shot blocker. That's not his role. That's never been his role. 
So I, I don't think that if, if Mahady can get to the rim, Gonzaga's posts are going to have to find ways to prevent him from scoring without fouling him. And that's, that might be tough. And so if Mahaney can get to the rim, get to the free throw line, put Gonzaga's bigs in foul trouble, that puts so much pressure on Gonzaga. And and um, in some of the games that they've really struggled against Pacific, Watson picked up two fouls in the first eight minutes or so. I think Graham E.K. had two fouls in the first like five minutes of that game. And if that becomes an issue for Gonzaga, it's, I mean, they have front court depth. They have four bigs, but, you know, they start three of them. So they, they're kind of limited in how much they can do there. So I think it starts with Mahaney. I think it has to start with him just because of how talented he is and how well he's played as the season has flipped into conference play. Uh, I mean, this team's struggles early in the season were a huge part because of him, you know, adjusting to being the man and, and having some some struggles offensively. And so I think this team kind of lives and dies by him in a similar way to Gonzaga with Anton Watson. And so I think... It starts with him. Certainly, you know, Marcelonis, if he has uh, early in the year, he had some horrifically bad shooting nights. If that were to show up, that could put more pressure on Mahaney, make things problematic for St. Mary's. So he's a he's a big factor as well. But I think it, it starts with the point guard. And in, and for both of these teams, I don't want to overlook the fact that both of them do have one game before they see each mm-hmm. other. Gonzaga does have LMU on on Tuesday night and then St. Mary's hosts Santa Clara on Wednesday. And I don't think either of those are going to be easy tests either. Uh, LMU has actually played St. Mary's really well the last two times. Uh, They, they won in the kennel the last time they visited. Mm -hmm. So this is still a, this is still a, a capable LMU team. And it's going to be the return of Dom Harris to the kennel. Uh, Andy, it's like seeing him return. And with that team, Mm -hmm. uh, just like some, some general thoughts of like what you're expecting to see. Uh, for Tuesday night. Yeah, it's unfortunate the way that things went with Dom in, in Spokane. The injury, he missed an entire year that obviously slowed his development and his ability to crack the rotation in last year's team. I think the expectation was that he'd play more for them, but you know they didn't know that Rasir Bolton was going to come back when they got that commitment from Malachi Smith. Suddenly they have two veteran guards on this roster. Uh, they were kind of committed to Nolan Hickman. Once they realized he wasn't a great point guard, they were kind of trying to scramble to find somebody else to step into that role. And, and Hunter Salas was kind of playing out of position and it didn't work for him. And Dom just never really kind of got that playing time. And and it's great to see him thriving. You know, he's he has done particularly well against not so great teams. If you look at his shooting splits against better teams, they He struggles. And so that'll be an interesting element of, you know, Gonzaga not only being a game that's kind of more emotionally uh, driven for him and for the Zags and for the kennel and everything. uh, It's also a good defensive team. So I'm really curious how he's going to play because LMU has been more dependent on him than I think uh, they may have planned to be. He has, I mean, which shout out to him for, for putting himself in that position, but the rest of their guards haven't been as consistent. And so it'll be interesting. I think Dom's the big factor in that game, regardless of the, outside factors uh, just in terms of if he shoots poorly that LMU team tends to not do very well so it should be a a fun game a highly emotional game but uh, one that Gonzaga absolutely cannot overlook when they're getting ready for St. Mary's yeah that that LMU team and there's so they have they brought in so many guards in the Mm -hmm. offseason it was almost like let's just get them all and see Mm -hmm. one of them has to stick Mm -hmm. right (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think that was almost the strategy of like they got a lot of good quality guys coming from uh, largely mid-major programs, smaller programs that most of them unfortunately haven't hit. But yeah, Dom Harris has been one of the more consistent options that they've had. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the what I one of the lists that one of the things between St. Mary's and Gonzaga is there have been a number of villains throughout the years um, in this rivalry. And each of us have picked a starting lineup of of villains from the other side. So I have f- five Zags. Andy has five Gales of like, who who are the list of guys that just get under our skin every time we either hear their name or s- saw them on the court. And Andy, I'll, I'll start with you. We'll go back and forth and let's do, we'll start at the guards and we'll work our way down to the center. Okay. Uh, start with the guards then, because I, I was going to start with the center, as you oh, could probably imagine. Or actually, you know what? Whichever way you want to start, like we'll just go back. Well, and I mean, I was going to start with 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 the true villain, Omar um, <laughs> Sam Han. He was the the ultimate first villain that I can recall. I mean, for me personally, as a freshman in his I think sophomore year or junior year, maybe 
uh, and just getting taught from the other Kennel Club board members like, hey, we don't like this guy. He didn't like us. We don't like him. Like, th that's what this is like. And I don't know how many games I'd been to before my first St. Mary's game, but that was when you kind of really got it. Like, that was my first real, like, college basketball experience of like, hey, we're, this isn't just Gonzaga going and beating some other team by 15 points and we're just happy they won. Like, this is there's like some emotion here and, and Omar really hammed it up as he always has shout out to him for kind of still getting booed at the Spokane airport, like a few years ago, like that. I love that story. Uh, he's a very, very good basketball player was very, very villainous. And, and uh, I think is a, a huge cog in this rivalry. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. Omar just the, the, the cachet that he carried mm -hmm. just like the, he had, he had the character to go along with his play on the court. Mm -hmm. Like that's what, that's what usually makes this. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to go with one, not quite the level of the character, but just like also the play, the look. Mm -hmm. I have my generation, I have to go with Adam Morrison yeah. as being that chief villain mm -hmm. uh, on the Gonzaga broadcast now. And every time I see him on camera, I still like cringe a little bit yeah. seeing him there <laughs> uh, because he was just so good. We know like the player of the year, he was top three pick in the NBA draft, but he was just, he came to play and he was ready to go in Moraga every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, and he seemed to just like thrive off of that energy from the crowd. Like he, he was one of the better college basketball players of his generation. And yeah, Adam Morrison is one. It's, it's hard to just kind of quantify, especially in that era of St. Mary's where we were still trying to get off the yeah. ground. And he was the guy um, in the midst of that Gonzaga run. Uh, I, I will admit like when, when Gonzaga lost to UCLA in that comeback and mm -hmm. Morrison hits the floor crying, like I definitely did enjoy that moment, <laughs> uh, but a lot, <laughs> a lot of people enjoyed that moment. Yeah. Um, I was with my sweet mates. I remember exactly where I was watching that game. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Adam Morrison is probably number one for me. Yeah, that's a, that's he's on a lot of teams lists, I think, for his his style and and uh, ability to beat you and look the way he did. I, I totally get that one. I, I'm going to go down to the point guard position guy who played with Sam Han at least for one year. Uh, Matthew Delavadova, uh, the, the, the mouth guard, uh, the kennel. We had a, a game, I think, his senior year where we every single person in the student section got a mouth guard and was wearing them uh, in, in honor of him, I guess. Kind of a uh, I mean, I, I would take that as a sign of respect, I guess. Um, very talented player, uh, was willing to kind of, you know, clap back at the kennel a little bit, always hit big shots. Uh, obviously, long, lengthy NBA career for him, one of the most talented players in that program, and and he let the kennel know about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Next one I'm going to, and Del Deli is one of the great ones. Like, I also just, when I think of him, I think of what he did at BYU and the Dell of a Dagger. That's the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's the BYU moment I remember him most for now. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy Pargo oh, okay. is All one right. that I would pull. As I, it was more along the lines of he was just so good. He was so physical. And because he was a, one of the guards for Gonzaga that was able to play above the rim, mm -hmm. uh, he the way he attacked the basket, the way he was able to really take over games late many times uh, just drove me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he obviously has had a lot. A uh, pretty long uh, professional career. Still, yeah. I think he's still playing right yeah, now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he is. He was just one of those guys that I that I dreaded seeing come into the building. Mm -hmm. uh, and because he was, because it seemed like when he saw us, he played better. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's usually the one that's, that that makes it that much more much. It, the dread just sets in that much more, knowing yeah. that they play better against you. Yeah. Uh, so Jeremy Pargo would be one of the guards I'm going with. I'm going look for my other guard. Uh, there's so many options. I mean, Mahaney's already put himself in that conversation. There's guys like Nar and Rayhan and, and Jordan Ford, but I'm going back to that same era again. Um, Mickey McConnell is the pick here. Uh, game winning three against Gonzaga in the kennel that took the absolute life out of that building in a way that I'll never forget. Uh, incredibly talented player uh, for that program for many years. Uh, I think that a, a guard, like if you're thinking about St. Mary's guards who've harassed Gonzaga, I think that that duo right there of, of Delhi and, and McConnell is, is a pretty devastating one. And, and I, I again, I, in a long list of fantastic guards for St. Mary's and guards who have given Gonzaga fits, those, those two stand out to me. I was going back and forth on 
on this one. And you know what? I act, think I am going to go, I'm going to switch mine because I got some feedback on, on Twitter about this one. Mm -hmm. And I initially had Matt Bolden as one of my other guards, mm -hmm. but I'm going to switch and I, and I have to say Josh Perkins, ah, okay. uh, Josh Perkins. I think it was along the lines of because of that era of Gonzaga basketball, mm -hmm. he was kind of the fifth guy in that starting lineup. Like yeah. he had incredible a talent around him mm -hmm. on those teams. And it seemed like that he was the one that always seemed to like that seemed to catch us at the wrong time for, on this. If you're looking at it from a St. Mary's lens, uh, Josh Perkins for everything that I know St. Mary's, fans will try to say he didn't do mm -hmm. he was one of the he was one of the more successful and winning with players gonzaga's ever had he he was he was a starter for what i think it was three of the four years yeah uh so you can't you can't take away just like the impact and what josh perkins meant and the role he was able to play on on those teams and and he was a just a thorn in the side of mm -hmm. a lot of saint mary's fans over the years yeah I'm going with, uh, for my, I guess, my small forward position here, I'm going to go with Calvin Hermanson. And uh, I may have a tiny bit of bias that he also went to my rival high school, so he just really didn't want to to be friends with me, clearly. Um, but really talented scorer. I just remember his ability to get those corner threes off, and it felt like he shot something like 80% in that spot. was a really gifted shooter. Uh, he had that kind of look in a similar way to Morrison of just like, doesn't look like a guy who should be killing you on the basketball court. And yet he did day in, day out. Uh, and I just remember he was a part of some of those St. Mary's teams uh, that, that took Gonzaga down, that, that uh, played. It was, that was a really competitive period of time between these two teams. Uh, and, and he was a part of a lot of, of Gonzaga losses against the Gales. And so he stands out to me. Uh, I, was, I almost went with Steve Holt, but I honestly just loved Stephen Holt. Like he was a fantastic, fun guy. Uh, and he was, you know, I already went with players from that era of, of St. Mary's basketball. So I, I thought Hermanson kind of fit well here. So next one, I'm going to go and all right, I'm switching this one to initially because I had Drew Timmy, but I'm mm -hmm. like, Drew Timmy didn't feel like a full villain to me. Like he was just <laughs> amazing. You had respect for how good he was. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to switch it. I'm going with Elias Harris. Mm, I thought Elias might be on there. <laughs> I, I'm going with Elias Harris because there was so often that he came in and just hit the dagger shot that, mm -hmm. that, that set the game in motion. The one I remember very clearly, I think it was the 2012 uh, WCC championship game. And yeah. same race, I think had a three point lead with, with less than 10 seconds to go. Elias Harris hits a, hits a three from the top of the key to send it to overtime. Uh, and that was one of the better Gonzaga St. Mary's games I think we've ever seen uh, that for that title. And that was a bragging rights title. There was like both teams were going to be in the tournament. So that was just a fun one to watch. But even when he first arrived, he was just so good. Yeah. And that just, it was like, oh, man, Gonzaga has another one of these guys. <laughs> and um, he, yeah, Elias Harris had a little like that energy, that toughness that you you didn't want to see <laughs> again. Uh, so Elias Harris. Yeah, that's um, a great pick. That's a great pick. Uh, for my final one, I was looking at a couple of bigs uh, to kind of go alongside Sam Hand. Like I thought about Malik Fitz, but he never really played that well against Gonzaga. I thought about Landale, but those he, that arrow just he wasn't really the villain. I, I didn't feel in the same way. So I'm going to go somewhat obscure. And I'm going to go with Bo Levesque. Uh, who had some really good games against Gonzaga, and he's kind of back in that same era we were talking about before. Uh, I know he had some some shouting matches with the kennel. He had some altercations where he was a very emotional guy, and and you could see it that, that it felt like the kennel was getting to him, and he was getting back to them. and And I just remember him more viscerally than I remember a lot of other players. And so, uh, and he was a, he was a, obviously a talented guy as well. Had a couple uh, really good seasons for the Gales. So uh, he would he would be my my four in this starting lineup uh, against the Zags. <laughs> All right, so that's a good one. I love I love Bo Levesque. It's just yeah. the the energy he brings really everywhere. Yeah. Uh, last pick, I'm going with who's probably the he's probably the Omar Light of this rivalry, and it's mm -hmm. Robert Sacre. Yeah. Like I can't I couldn't make a list of of Gonzaga villains without saying uh, his name. Uh, he it was kind of very similar way in the in the the sort of energy that that he brought that Omar brought at least like it felt like that on our end because mm -hmm. uh, he would be talking to the students like he would have that energy not quite like the not quite the level of player that Omar was at the end of his career but just he was so good so consistent over the course of his Gonzaga career obviously ended up 
uh, playing in the league as well mm-hmm. for a while. Uh, Robert Sacre just just got under my skin like no other and yeah. maybe even more than some of the others on this list. Uh, but Robert Sacre would round, rounds out my five. Love it. Great pick. All right. Um, so those who are listening, uh, go, go ahead and actually let us know who are your villains. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be great to kind of see who, what other names pop up. I mean, I had a few others that were on my list that not quite that level but it's mm-hmm. great to see them great to remember these names and remember just like how the part they played in this rivalry uh andy thanks a lot for hopping on uh it's great always chatting with you uh gonzaga and saint mary's this saturday and then for for obviously all zag coverage go to find andy on the locked on zags podcast you can find them there as well thanks zach always right. always fun to t- chat looking forward to chatting again later this week yep 